Hello, this is Pastor Brad, and it's good to be with you again today. Two more weeks, we're going to be able to uh, rejoin together at Emmanuel. We're going to meet at 930. We're going to restart our services. All of our churches, as we're gathering together again, we're just praying that God will just protect us. God will bless that we'll be able to just, in a healthy manner, come back into uh, God's house and just worship together and be uh, that body of Christ together again. You have been the church out there, and God has been blessing you. He's been using you, encouraging you. We've all faced challenges. That is true. But uh, I can't wait until we can all be back together again. So that's coming up. We're in the Gospel of John. I love the Gospel of John. It's simply about the Gospel. It's about good news. It's about Christ. It's about how Christ is showing us how we can have a relationship with the Father through Him. It's showing us just the glory of God, showing us how awesome God the Father is, and yet we get to see God in the flesh. What a beautiful thing. This is a great chapter. We're in chapter 16. We're in the final discourse. Jesus is ministering to his disciples. It's the last evening before he goes to the cross. There is, there is so much on the heart of Jesus Christ as he's spending time with the disciples here. And yet he's loving his disciples. He's teaching them. He's equipping them. To the very end, he is pouring out his love to them. We're going to encounter the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, we don't talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit enough. Kind of in our circles, we just kind of add this baggage to the picture about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we're hesitant to talk about the Holy Spirit. He is so significant to your life and to my life. Without the Holy Spirit, we are left powerless to do what God has called us to do. <clears throat> he enables us. And so I'm excited about what we're going to see this morning. Before we get into that, let's uh, simply look at a few verses. We're in chapter 16, and I want to pick it up. In, well, let's just start in verse 4. Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. That's those, that's those who stand against the Lord. He says in the middle of that verse, I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. The disciples are just feeling uh, deep emotional pain. They're feeling anxiety. They're feeling fear. The fear of what's going to happen when Jesus leaves them. He says, he's, I'm going to go. They're going to be marked men. They know it. He's been with them for three years now. He says, there are things that, that uh, I haven't told you because I was with you. He's protected them from the wrath of, of religious leaders in a, in a culture who hasn't believed. And yet he's been with them. He's been their protector. He's watched over them. Now he's going to leave. And so he's preparing them for the next phase, which is really important. He says, I have more to say to you, but he says, you can't bear it now. Just shortly after the cross, after the resurrection, they're going to have an understanding that is so different than where they are now. But right now is not the time. There's, it's not the time to communicate some things that still yet need to be said. He knows, he knows that they feel the sorrow, that they're weighted down. It's really neat here. He doesn't rebuke them for what they're feeling. He doesn't call them up short. He doesn't tell them to buck up. He doesn't lash out at them. He doesn't say, you know, if you, if you just stop for a minute and realize what I'm going through, you're so selfish. He doesn't do any of that. You know, he loves them. He often loves us the same way as we're going through just times of insecurity and doubt and, and, and facing the unknown. God really loves us. The Lord really loves us, and he shows that here. And so he's ministering to them. And he's going to reveal to us the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helping us. Look at verse 7. Jesus continues and he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. He's going to send a Helper to us. He's already began to mention the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now he's going to give us more information. He's speaking to the disciples here specifically. He's preparing them for what's about to come. 
He says, you're not going to be alone. You've had me these three years. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to rise again. I'm going to go back to heaven. But you're not going to be alone. I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to be with you through and in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, of God in you. Just in loving care, he, he communicates with them. They will have power. They will have enablement. They will have a helper. What a beautiful thing. He's not going to help them in ways that maybe they might imagine. You know, we think of the, when we think of help and when they think of help and they sift it through the, the grid of what they've seen in the three years they've been with Christ and what they know of the Word of God, they might have, they might have had some preconceived notions of maybe what this might look like. Um, maybe they would be strong like Samson was, you know. They're just average guys, but maybe have a strength that would be supernatural. Um, maybe the ability to, to interpret dreams and to know dreams like, Fer like uh, Joseph did with Pharaoh. Maybe the ability to see into the future like the prophets were able to. Uh, maybe, have, um, maybe have a wisdom that is just breaks all the charts like Solomon did. Maybe have a, uh, you know, have a staff like, like Moses did, this miracle staff in, in which they could do all kinds of things and the Spirit of God would, would enable them. Uh, maybe protection from elements, from fire, from, uh, from lions, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or, or Daniel, something like that. Um, maybe immortality, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, we get a glimpse of, uh, of our immortality that God's going to give us. Just look at the G uh, ministry of Jesus. He could, read, he could read minds, he could read the heart. Maybe they would have that capability with the Spirit of God. The ability to walk on water, the ability to heal diseases. Some of these things they've already had exposure to, miracles and signs. Uh, the, the ability to, to, uh, to multiply food like Jesus did with the loaves and the fishes. Uh, the ability maybe to, maybe to a fly. You know, Jesus is going to ascend and one day he's going to come back. The second coming, those things they don't quite understand, of course. But, you know, what, what might have come through their mind when he, he mentioned the word helper? Um, a lot of things might come to our mind, too. Things that would be bold and, and outward and things that when they're exercised, people would just see them. It'd be unmistakable, you know, God's at work. You know, it's interesting that uh, the Spirit of God, he's, I'm going to give you a helper, that word uh, parakletos. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you God himself. But often the ministry of the Spirit of God is going to be like that smil a small, still voice in our hearts. We think of... Um, we think of Elijah. You know, Elijah. Elijah uh, met with God. He had he had an opportunity uh, to, to 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 meet with God, and, and God's presence was with him. And, and and so so God revealed His presence to him in different ways, and in, in the wind, and in an earthquake, and in a fire. And God was there, and yet and yet Elijah didn't sense that very deep presence of God until God simply just spoke in a, in a small, still voice, in a, in a low whisper. And it's then that Elijah's heart was captured by the very presence of God, and he, and he had to hide his, his very face. You know, the Spirit of God is often like that, uh, speaking into our life uh, with that smil a small, still voice. Uh, it causes us to listen, to be keenly aware of the presence of God, to shut all those other things and influences out the busyness of life and to slow down and actually listen to the voice of God. The Spirit of God is powerful, but He often works in ways where He's seeking to, to, uh, to garner our, our attention and, and, and to gain the attention of our heart. He is our helper. You know, the, the apostles would still be able to do some, some uh, ministries with signs and wonders. But as, as they came towards the end of their ministry there in Acts and the epistles, those signs and wonder abilities would, would, uh, would pass away and it would simply be the power of the Word of God until the Scriptures are written and then all, that would all go away. Let's look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit specifically because that's what He promises to them. We look at verse 8 and so Jesus picks it up. He says, When the Holy Spirit comes, when the Helper comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. I want to, I want to pick up that first, that first phrase, that first thought. He will convict. That's what the Holy Spirit's going to do. Verse 8 specifically puts it in these terms. He's going to convict the world. That's what he's going to do. He's going to convict the world. The word is elenko in the Greek, we see. Uh, it's a word that's used of Christ, too. Jesus, as he was speaking to the religious leaders, to the Pharisees, as they were, they were, they would accuse him of a blasphemy. They would accuse him of doing the works of of Beelzebub, of Satan. They would attribute his ministry to Satan. 
they would they would uh, accuse him of sin. But Jesus said these words in John eight forty six, pointedly. He says, "Which one of you convicts me of sin? Which one of you elencos me of sin? Which one of you can lay a compelling case before me of actual sin?" None of them could do that. None of them could accuse Jesus of any kind of sin, small or large, for he was sinless. That's the word that's used here. They couldn't bring that case to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when? Because there was no sin. The Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of sin. He's going to lay a case before the world, before every human being, before every individual. He lays a case before our heart, a case that we can't win, a case which he does. Because what he does is he reveals the truth of our heart. He reveals our need. He reveals the offense. Ultimately, as he does that, as he begins to work on our heart, he silences the opposition. He silences the, the response. He silences the arguments that we might lay up before him. Because it was, it was, as we see the evidence, the Spirit of God reveals that they're nothing, that they have no basis, they have no foundation. And he convinces us of our sin, of the error of our way, and he breaks our heart, and he leads our heart to him, in, in contrition and he heals our heart and he heals our brokenness and he brings us into a relationship with this father through Christ and he conforms our hearts to his love and to his grace and the spirit of God does all that he lays a case before us and he overwhelms us with the truth of our condition and he overwhelms us with the truth of his love and his grace and he breaks down every barrier every argument we could we could possibly lay before him that's what the spirit of God does and so that still, small voice of the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God is working in your heart and when it's working in mine, this is what, it thunders into our life. It is, a, it is a voice, it is a conviction, it is a case being laid against our own heart that resonates with, with uh, loudness into our life. And we can't escape the message of truth that the Spirit of God is laying down across our heart. And ultimately, we surrender and we yield. And instead of running from God, we run towards God. And we find grace. We find mercy. We find forgiveness. We find the love of God. And that's all because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who is doing the work of conviction in our heart. He uses the Word of God. Hebrews 4, 12, and 13 remind us that the Word of God, it's living and it's powerful. Uh, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces into our, into our life, into our heart. It, it, it has a, the ministry of discernment into our life and into your, into your life and mine. Nothing in your heart and nothing in my heart is hidden from the probing work of the, of the Spirit of God. We all must give account to God because of the Word of God, because of the Spirit of God revealing its truth into our life. All of us are given an account. And so he uses the word of God, but he uses the word of God then in power, great power. And that's where his, that's where his word just thunders into our life. Because it says here in Acts 27, on the day of Pentecost, as Peter is preaching, the Jews there, they are broken. It says here they are cut to the heart because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was poured out. And as he's poured out, he is touching hearts and he's laying a case across the hearts of those who are hearing. And it is so compelling that they are brought to the only conclusion that they can have, and that is to repent. That is to yield to the work of the Spirit of God and, and turn to, by faith to Jesus Christ. And their response is simply this, it's repentance. God, what, what, what are we going to do? What can we do? What shall we do? What, what must I do to be saved? And they respond in faith respond in faith they were cut to the heart well verse 8 and 9 says when he when he comes he's going to convict the world concerning sin verse 9 concerning sin because they do not believe in me his first work of bringing the case against our heart is, th is this it's just simply revealing to us the need of our sin that's what he does in these verses he convicts us he lays that case of sin before our hearts. He shows us, he shows us our offense that we are to God. He shows us the offense of our sin, of our works. You know, we do a lot of a lot of good works. We do a lot of good things, and yet all those things, uh, no matter how good they are, they're tainted by sin. Now, that middle letter in the word sin is I. 
everything good that I might do and that I do accomplish in life is tainted by the reality that the motivation of all those things is for me. It's, it's, it's about me. It's about I. Me, myself, and I. And it may benefit others, and it may feel good, and it, and it may just bring a, a joy into my life, yet at the same time, it hasn't brought me any closer to God because it's not, I've not done it for the glory of God. I've not done it because an awareness of the presence of God. I've not done it in the power of God. I've not done it to reflect a relationship with God. I've done it for me. I've done it for others, but it's somehow been about me. Sin taints everything that I do. And when he convicts us of sin, he reveals the offense of our sin. The great sin, the great sin in this verse is what? It's unbelief. He says here, because they do not believe in me. John 3.38 just reminds us, whoever does not believe is condemned already. Whoever does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God is condemned already. The Bible reminds us that there is not, there is not a righteous man in this earth. There's no one that's right before God. We all in our sin are an offense to God. We are an offense to God. And yet in love, He reaches out to us. He came to seek and to save those who were lost, those who had the greatest need, those who were an offense to Him. He came to seek out His love to us, to reach us. Look at verse 10. And it says, And He convicts concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see Me no longer. He convicts us concerning our position with God. We're not right with God. He lays that before us. We know that. Initially here, this is just the thought is he reveals to us that our lack of just simply being right with God. Mark 7, verses 21, 22, 23, just reminds us that everything that come out of our, comes out of our heart is a reflection of the evil that's in there. We're all evil at our core, all of us because of sin. We're all capable of doing the worst most terrible possibly thing, possible things in this world and in this life. Uh, there are none of us that are any better than anyone else because in the right circumstances, in the right setting, in the right experience, we can be guilty of the worst because of sin that lies within us. We may not have, we may not have done the worst and the most vile and the most terrible sins. We may not have committed those things, but we are capable of them because sin lives within us. And it comes out... It's expressed in everything that we do. Everything that we do is tainted. And it defiles us. We're, we see here, it defiles us in our hearts. What is man that we can be pure? Or he who was born of woman, can, can he be righteous? If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Who can say, I have made my heart pure and I am clean from my sin? None of us can do that. No matter how religious we might be, none of us can, can accomplish that at all. But he also reveals, he lays the case across our heart, not only that we're not right with God, but this is the, this is the beautiful thing. He shows us, in fact, that Jesus Christ is the one who is righteous. For our sake, he made him, the Father made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In a relationship with Christ, through faith in Christ, through that forgiveness that we find in Christ, we are brought into a relationship with God the Father through Christ. And in that moment of faith, of believing Jesus Christ, of receiving Him as Savior, we are given a righteousness that, that is not ours, that we could not create, that we could not... Um, it doesn't come from us at all. It comes from God alone. He places His righteousness across our life and into our hearts. And he gives us the position of a child of God, righteous before him that can never change. What a beautiful thing. Philippians reminds us that that righteousness, it's not of my own, it's of God. It comes through faith in Christ. It comes through faith. Have you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ? Have you said, Lord, I have, I have nothing to bring to the table, but I bring myself and I yield myself to you. Lord, save me. Lord, change me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, please use me transform my life because I know you can do that that is your love he convicts us as well of of judgment we see that here as well look at verse 11 concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged Acts tells us here that he has already set that day he has fixed a day 
on which he will judge the world of in righteousness. Through Christ, that man is Christ there, that man who rose from the grave in victory. That man is Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we will be judged. In righteousness, the judgment, the verdict that Jesus Christ will come to about your life and about my life will be the right verdict because it will be done in righteousness. But there is, there is another judgment that takes place here. There is a judgment against Satan himself. We see that expressly in this verse. Because this, he says, the ruler of this world is judged. That takes us back to takes us back to Genesis. We see here in Genesis chapter 3, at the Garden of Eden, Satan has tempted Adam and Eve. Now God is talking to the serpent, to Satan. I will put hostility between you and the woman, Eve, between your offspring, that is everyone in this world, and her offspring, that is believers. Ultimately, it points to Jesus Christ specifically. And he, Jesus Christ, he was going to bruise your head, Satan. And you, Satan, you're going to bruise his heel. At the cross, you bruise his heel. You're going to hurt him. You're going to wound him. But what he's going to accomplish at the cross is this. He's going to, he's going to bring a fatal blow against you. He's going to die. You're going to think you're going to have the victory, but you're going to find out that's not victory. He's going to rise from the dead. He will win the victory. And that will bring a fatal blow against you. In fact, the very reason that Jesus came was this, was to destroy the works of the devil. The control they have in our life, the control they have in this world, one day that is going to be absolutely broken because it's already been won at the cross. In fact, it's already happened, John tells us. John chapter 12, verse 31, Now, now is the judgment of this world, and now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Even though it's yet to come down the, world, down, down the line, even as he spoke here, it was to come at the cross, it is spoken as though it's already been accomplished because that is how certain it is. And when he went to the cross, he won that battle. And he judged Satan's evil and his sin, and Satan lost the eternal battle at that moment. Jesus Christ won the victory over sin, over Satan, over death. A sentence is going to be executed down the road. Revelation shows us clearly there will come a day when the devil who's deceived all of us, the whole world, is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. He's going to be tormented forever. He will never come out from that time, place of torment. He will receive the judgment that is sure. He, he is free today, and yet he's already judged. He is a marked man and he will not escape the judgment that is coming him. It is only God's timetable that prevents him from being judged this moment right now. Because Jesus Christ won the victory at the cross. By giving his life, he won back the deed of our lives, of mankind, with his life. And he paid the penalty for sin. And he offers now the, the gift of eternal life, of, of a transformed, cleansed life in Christ. Also, the Holy Spirit ultimately accomplishes this important ministry. Verses 13, 14, and 15. In fact, verse 12, we see this. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. He's going to share more after the cross, after the resurrection. He's got more to say, but they're not ready. They're not ready just yet. It overwhelmed them. He says in verse 13, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal Jesus Christ. He's going to speak the truth of Jesus Christ. He's going to be a mouthpiece for Jesus Christ. That's what he's going to do. He is going to minister for the very glory of God. John reminds us here in 1526, when the Spirit comes, ultimately, he will bear witness about me. Everything that the Spirit does in our hearts. When he is working, he has one goal. It is to keep your heart your mind, the trajectory of your life, the goals for your life, the purpose for your life, the attitude of your life focused on Christ. He moves in your heart and my heart so that we might honor Jesus Christ in everything that we do. 
He moves to convict us. He moves to, to encourage us so that all that we do might be for Jesus Christ. His purpose is to reveal Christ. That first, mo that first expression with the gospel into anyone's life is the first step of that purpose. When he touches a heart with the gospel, he is revealing Jesus Christ. When an unbeliever receives Jesus Christ as Savior, from that moment on, the Spirit of God is at work in, in your heart and in mine with every step to keep us walking in conformity to Jesus Christ. He's, he's um, you think of a spotlight as it illuminates. You know, the spotlight is not, is not, the, is not the central focus of a display. The spotlight is to be off over here. In fact, you're not really supposed to notice the spotlight. It's supposed to be down here. The purpose of the spotlight is to illumine the object that's being illuminated. It's to show it off so the whole world can see whether it's a, a building or an arrangement or a, a Christmas trees or, or whatever it might be. The spotlight is to illumine in the very best possible light the object. And Jesus Christ, he is, he is that in our life. And his goal is to illuminate Jesus Christ into our life. His goal is to use our life so that we would illuminate Jesus Christ and show him off in our life. His goal is to reveal Jesus Christ in your life and mine. And he does it perfectly and he does it well. He often does it with a small, still voice. But when he uses that small, still voice, when we slow down and we listen to the word of God and its use in our life, it thunders with conviction and it thunders with power. And it touches your life and it touches my life and it changes us. It changes the path I'm on and it changes the motivation under which I operate and it changes me. It is powerful. It is divine. You know, the goal, the goal of that ministry is to keep us moving towards Christ. So that in everything I do, I do it, I do it to become more like Christ, to conform to the image of Christ, so that every day. Christ is being reflected in my life with more clarity. You know, if you've been to airports and you, and you go between uh, gates, you know, sometimes you have to go a long ways. We've all got those stories at an airport, don't we? Having to run, I could tell you some. Which is you're going from a one point A to point B and you've got a long way to go. You'll encounter these, uh, these walkways and these long halls that, are, that, are, that propel you forward, right? You step on those things and boom, you start going forward and they... And you keep walking and you walk faster and faster. I've been on those and I've ran on those before. And I've passed people on those before. And, you know, as the Spirit of God is working in your life, He assumes that you're moving forward. He assumes that you're walking. Because every believer has his eyes set on Christ. Every believer has his eyes fixed on the goal to live for Christ. But the Spirit of God propels us forward. He enables us to go with efficiency and with power. That's what He does. His goal is to imprint the image of Jesus Christ on our life, just like a copier. When you paste, put a piece of paper on, the, on a copier and you shut the door and you push start and that light comes on from underneath and it takes a picture of that image and it transfers that image to, the, to another piece of paper and you have an exact copy, the Spirit of God, His desire is to work in your life and mine. And His desire is to transfer the image of Christ from the pages of the Word of God onto your life, under the, under the lines of your heart. We're to be a living letter for Jesus Christ. We're to reveal Jesus Christ in everything that we do. We are, we are to show Jesus Christ. We are to become a copy of Jesus Christ by how we live. Our attitudes and our goals, our desires. We're to hate sin like Jesus hated sin. We're to love righteousness and mercy and grace like he did. We're to love the body of Christ like he did. We're to love his word like he did. We're to embrace the mission of Jesus Christ like he did. That's what the Spirit of God is doing in your life and mine. He changes us. The most powerful work of the Spirit of God is not all these external things that we see in the Old Testament, you know, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Moses and his staff and, and all these outward expressions. The most powerful work of the Holy Spirit, and those things were awesome and wonderful, by the way. God used those specifically to, to, to bring glory and honor to his name, and that's how he chose to do it. In your life and mine, he uses the small, still voice of the Holy Spirit of God. Folks, you and I, we got to listen you got to sit down and you got to open the Word of God because that's what He uses. you got to read it with faith. Say, Lord, what do you have for me today? Lord, change me today. Lord, use me today. Lord, take anything in my heart today that's a barrier right now between me and you. Eliminate that barrier by your grace. 
Help me to confess my sin, to confess that that barrier so that you can break that down. And, and to, to get, today, together, we can walk with you. And I can accomplish whatever it is you want me to do today because I'm right with you. The Spirit of God does all that. I pray that you listen to the Spirit of God. I pray that you're a student of His Word. I pray that you are learning the voice of God because you're listening to His Spirit. What does His voice sound like? It is the voice of conviction. It is the voice of encouragement. It is the voice of peace. It is the voice of the ministry of the Word of God. We will find it very difficult to hear the Spirit's voice, His movement in our life when we're not in the Word. If the Word is not being poured into my life, I have set aside the very tool that the Spirit of God uses in my life with most power. I have said that's not what I want. And when I set the Word of God aside, I'm saying, the Spirit, Spirit, I don't want your work in my life either. If you want the Lord Jesus Christ to change your life, if you want the Spirit of God to transform you with His peace, if you want Him to transform you with a, with a quietness of heart and, and with, a, with a purpose that, that rises above the challenges of your life, then pour your life into His Word and let Jesus pour His life into your heart by His Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would help us to that end. May we listen to the Spirit of God. To, this, to the disciples, these verses meant everything. He would remind them of the truth that he had been teaching them for three years. He would remind them and enable them to remember these very things with specifically so that they could write to us the Word of God, the inspired Word of God. God, he pours your Word, you pour your Word into our hearts and into our mind pray that we would listen to your spirit and be conformed to the image of Christ. Please, Lord, help us to yield so that we can enjoy the blessing of walking in Christ. Lord, may we listen to the spirit. May we be in very intentional about the spirit's role in our life because it's the key. To God be the glory for that heart who is committed to that. For God, to God be the glory for what you're going to do through your spirit. In our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.